Hello, my name is Kishwani. This is K E S H W A N I Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here, the GMAT official guide 2024. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Always make sure that this book is in front of you when you're working, when we are working together. Today is our lesson number 22. Today is our lesson number 22, and we are on page number 91. Page number 91 has six problems in it. 111, 112, 113 are the ones that we did yesterday, and today we'll do 14, 15, and 16. Problem 14, as you can see, is already on the blackboard. I'm going to read the problem to you as usual, then I'm going to get out of the frame. You're going to pause the video, do it yourself, and then we'll compare your work against the work that we'll do together. That's the routine. Here we go. We are told that x times y does not equal to 0. Now this bit that you see there, that's not in the book, obviously. That's not going to be in the exam. This is something I'm telling you. When they tell you that x times y does not equal to 0, that's their way of saying that is, neither one of them can be 0. If, because it's either x or y were 0, the product would have been 0. We are further told that x squared minus y squared Rather, let me start again. We further told that x squared times y squared minus x times y equals 6. And the question is, based on that statement, which of the following could, which of the following could be, not must be, which of the following could be y in terms of x. In other words, we have to solve y, in, which of the following could be y in terms of x. Here are the answer choices. The first statement says y is equal to 1 over 2x. Second statement says y is equal to negative 2 over x. 37 says y is equal to 3 over x, and these are the answer choices. 1, 2, 1 and 2, 1 and 3, 2 and 3. Pause the video and do it yourself. Well, let's see what we can do. Let's see what we can do. We need the room, so I'm going to raise all of these st three statements. We don't need any of this either. Let's see what we can do. We can, here we have x squared, y squared, here we have xy, let's take out the xy common. If we take out x and y common, in the first term we are left with x, y, in the second term we have 1 equal to 6. The way, we are, the way I am about to do it, there are two ways you can go about this problem. One, is, one way is to solve this in a very classical, very traditional, very algebraic, geeky, nerdy way, the way they, that you are expected to solve, as I said, in a classical way. The other one is quick and dirty way. Quick and dirty way is what I am showing you right now. Take out x, y common, and we are left with this thing. And since the product is 6, there aren't, too many, there aren't too many choices here. There aren't too many possibilities. It has to be, well, it can be 2 times 3. It can be 2 times 3, because if x times y is 2, if x times y is 2, then 2 minus 1 is not going to work. But it can be, it can be 3. x, and y, x times y can be 3. 3 minus 3 times 3 minus 1 will give us 6. That works. Which means, the question is asking which of the following could be, which means x times y, x times y could equal 3. Now I forgot what the question, the question was, which of the following could be the y in terms of x? If you solve for y, y is equal to 3 over x. Or 3 over, there you go, 3 over x. And that was, that was statement number 3. There we go. Right away, right away, you can knock out all the answer choices which does not have 3 in it. Statement 3 works. And the possibility is to try negative numbers. And the possibility is to try the negative numbers. But here's what's going to happen. If we try, if we try negative 3, that would not work. Because negative 3, negative 3 times negative 4 does not equal 6. What we, did to, what we need to do now is to make x times y negative 4. A negative, if x times y is negative 4, then negative 4, or rather negative 2. Let's make, because you see I stopped myself, because here we're going to end up with a negative 5. That's what you have to do, you just have to play around. 
let's make x times y equal to negative 2. So then, let's erase this part, we no longer did, did it. If x times y is negative 2, then here we have negative 2, negative 2, which is x times y, minus a 1, and that does work. Negative 2 times negative 3 does equal 6, which means x times y could be negative 2. And the question knows which of the following could be y in terms of x. The y could be negative 2 over x. And that's it. Those are the only two possibilities. Because the product has to equal to 6. The only way you can make the product of two numbers equal to 6 is make both of them positive or make both of them negative. Because we need positive 6 here. They both need to be negative. Here they are both negative. negative. We have a negative 2 and negative 3. And this one was step in number. This was statement number 2. So the answer is 2 and 3 only. 2 and 3 only. The answer is E. Now let's do it in a classical way. Now let's do it algebraic way. We're going to do it algebraic way using the quadratic, quadratic equation. So we have x squared times y squared minus xy is equal to 6. Let's treat this xy as a variable, let a equal to x times y. And if we do that, this equation becomes a squared minus a, and bring the 6 to the other side, minus 6 equals 0. Now we have nice quadratic equations. We're looking for two numbers whose product is negative 6 and whose sum is, happens to be negative 1. That's going to be negative 3 and positive 2. a squared minus negative 3 plus There you go. Because negative 3a and a positive 2a will give us a negative a, and negative 3, negative 3 and a positive 2 is going to give us negative 6. That's all. Take out the a common from the first two terms, and we end up with a minus 3. From the second two terms, take out positive 2 common, and we end up with a minus 3. Now, if you look at this part and this part, we have a minus 3 common. And here we have a plus 2, and has to equal to 0. Let's continue this on the top. But I hope that you are able to see that none of this is necessary. You don't have this kind of luxury. You don't have that kind of time in the exam to fool around with the quadratic equations when you can just as well solve the bloody thing by putting in some simple numbers. For six, how, how, how complicated can it possibly be? One is very straightforward, two times three. Then try the negative numbers. And like a fool, I tried negative three and negative, and negative four. That didn't work. So immediately I said to myself, that's not working. Let's try negative two and then negative three. Negative two and negative three gives us positive six. Just play, just play around with it. See what happens. That's it. So which, which implies that either, either a minus three is equal to zero, or a plus two is equal to zero. And a, remember, was x times y. Now either this is zero, in which case x times y is equal to three, which will give us, which will give us y is equal to three over x, just like before, or x plus y plus 2 is equal to 0, in which case x times y is equal to negative 2, which means y must be negative 2 over x. But as we said it already before, this was all not necessary. Let's do 115. Let's do 115 is asking us 4.8 times 10 raised to 9 square root sign all the way all the way through. Question is how much is this thing approximately? That's all they're asking. How much is this approximately? Do it yourself. Pause the video and do it yourself. Well, first what we're gonna do. Let's break this up. Let's break up this 10 raised to 9 as 4.8 times 10 times 10 raised to 8. Why 10 raised to 8? Because we cannot take a square root of this quantity. 10 raised to 9, you cannot take a square root of it. But 10 raised to 8, the square root of it is exactly 10 raised to, 10 raised to 4. So 
that makes our life easy. Another thing it does in the process is that now we have 4.8 times 10 which is 48 times 10 raised to 8. We, we are asked to take the square root of it and since we are being asked to find the approximate value, let's pretend this, this 48, let's pretend that this 48 is 49. There we go. Square root of 49 is 7. We already know what that is. And that's our answer. 70,000. That was number 115. Let's do 116, shall we? In 116 we are told that in a class, in a given class, in a group of students rather, 80% are, are taking calculus. We are further told that 60% of those who are taking calculus are also taking physics. We are further told that 10% are taking neither. So we have three pieces of information, one, two and three. Here's the question. What percentage are taking physics? What percentage of this group of students is taking physics? So one more time I'm going to read it to you. 80% are taking calculus. We are told that of those 80%, 60% of those who are taking calculus, in other words, 60% of those 80% who are taking calculus are also taking physics. We also know that 10% of them are taking neither. What percentage of them are taking physics? Go ahead and do it yourself. Pause the video. Oh, let's see what you can do. As you can clearly see, that this problem clearly calls for a Venn diagram. Let's set it up as a Venn diagram. It will make our life that much easier. We need the room, so we need to raise some of this stuff. I'm also taking physics. Let's put it here so we don't forget it. First thing first, before we forget it, 10% because we already raised it, so before we forget it, we know 10% are taking neither. That goes there. Now let's deal with calculus and physics. We know 80% are taking calculus. We know the 60%, 60% of those who are taking calculus are also taking physics. 60% of 80, six, 6 times 8 is 48. Which means 48%, which means 48% of these people who are taking calculus are also taking physics. They go here. 48% are taking both. And as soon as we put 48 here, we need to subtract 48 from here, because otherwise we'll end up double counting them. So that gives us 2, and then 7 minus 4 is 3, that's 32%. In other words, only 32% of people, only 32% of people are taking calculus only. 48% are taking both. We have to figure out what goes in here. What goes in here depends on what these add up to. Let's do it here. So that's 32. That's 32. That's 48. And that's 10. That's a 0. That will become 4, 8. Oh, it's not exactly 90. That, that's very straightforward. Which means 10% of them are taking, only 10% of the students are taking physics only. But that's not our answer. The question was, what percentage of students are taking physics? The percentage of students who are taking physics, they fall in two categories. Percentage of students who are taking physics are those students who are taking physics only, which is 10, and those students who are taking both, which is 48. So to answer, answer to our question was, 
what percentage of the students are taking physics? The answer is 58% are taking physics. Some of them are taking both physics and calculus. 48% out of the 58 and 10% are taking only physics. That was it. That was question number 116. That was the very last problem on the page. So we'll call it a day. We'll meet tomorrow again and we'll carry on. Okay? Bye now.